Thank you to the panelists. Does the committee have questions? Deborah? I'll try and stay alive for you as a moderator, but um, so Heather, you spoke to the institutional variability. Um, even with all the regulations that we have, there's still that institutional variability. How, what types of recommendations or uh, guidance or whatever could be made available to institutions that would level that institutional culture to create greater standardization? Uh, I think it's a, a great question. I think the recommendations that SACARP has made and those some of the ones that were discussed on the previous panel, having multi-agency guidance that says here is what we think of return of results, when that's okay, and resolving, uh, resolving the issue of uh, when, when something is in the designated record set and uh, seems to institutions to be required to return if the, insti if the individual asks for it uh, and may be prohibited if, it wasn't, if the test wasn't done in a CLIA certified lab. Those, I think those are the beginnings of trying to uh, level, the, level the playing field and have not so much uh, reliance on what we call sub-regulatory guidance and commentary and un, uh, different interpretation from institution to institution as to what is law and what is an opinion of the agency that is or is not enforceable. Richard? So, so the, the guidance from SACR was available in 2015, so that clearly didn't go far enough because you still have the institutional variability. I think the primary issue is that many of the recommendations from SACARP were not implemented. So the recommendations remain out there but haven't actually changed the, uh, the regulations or guidance that comes from the agency, which is what the institutions rely on. I appreciate the opportunity to make that, that clarification because the institutions alone can't work off of uh, the the guidance that doesn't bind them from SACAR. Richard. Are there any systems currently available for research labs to improve their quality short of CLIA that could be incorporated into this? Uh, let me attempt that. Um, there actually are not. Um, I think the um, a recent um, initiative by the National Institutes of Health to uh, require answering certain questions about uh, the um, value of the analytes and their history that are used in the research and what procedures are developed to develop the background information for the hypothesis-driven research uh, is a first step toward um, raising the consciousness of the researcher that these are important issues. Um, a lot of that is not directed to human subject research, but is actually using other types of research, such as animal models, but it's also relevant to human subject research. So this is, a, this is the first step at, uh, this is not part of the score that a research grant gets at this point, but that is something that I think the National Institutes of Health is gonna think about as they start, it's only started last year, uh, the requirement, and so I think this is a learning process. I think this is a long process. There is no known accreditation standard for research laboratories. Uh, research laboratories develop their reputation based on their peer-reviewed research. Uh, where it is published, um, the type of peer review that is used. Uh, these days, with more online, um, uh, 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 open access journals that are have, in my personal opinion, very rinky-dink peer review processes. And when I review for them, I'm amazed at how few questions I'm asked, and I'm, I reject a paper, and I see that it's out. Uh, so uh, these are not particularly rigorous processes in many cases, and more and more research is being um, sent to these um, quasi-peer review systems 
it's fast, information gets out, but the reliability is uh, in, to be questioned. Uh, so there's some balance between submitting a paper to a high value re peer review process where you go through several revisions, uh, adding experiments, uh, addressing the reviewer's concerns, and having nothing, and there's some happy medium there, and in the research world, we know which journals are more respected than others based on, we read the articles and we see what's missing and what's not, and um, in, in the end, it's the article that is cited the most that, over a long period of time, that has the most um, value to the biomedical research enterprise, but that's a long-term process. Um, yeah, just to follow up on that, Richard, were you asking primarily about the reproducibility issue or the return to patients clinical analytical validity issue? I was asking uh, in reference to the quality of, of the product produced from the, from the research laboratory. A, a research product or a clinical product? A, a research product. Research. Yeah I, I, yeah, I would just then second what Mark said, and I think for better or worse, the entire system is built upon peer review yeah. in many levels, both in the granting and in the publishing. Uh, realms, and so I think that's where we currently are right now. And, and given, as as Mark uh, very clearly laid out, the unbelievable heterogeneity of different kinds of research and different approaches to answer or sometimes even pretty similar questions, it would be a mind-numbingly broad uh, task to set standards. I just can't even envision how that could happen. Yeah. I think if we were going to start a process, we would go for the larger labs. So, you know, we have this concept in, um, in many federal laws that make a distinction between large organizations, small organizations, large employers, small employers. And I've been thinking analogously to research laboratories. The examples that were in the panel uh, earlier today, uh, most of those studies were very large, well-funded studies that had a great infrastructure. That's an, a first step at trying to develop some um, standards or guidances uh, of, of, of this, these are the things to aspire to. Um, but this, the smaller the laboratory, the more variability there's going to be. And as uh, Deborah Leonard pointed out, these research laboratories have graduate students, medical students, uh, people in training who are doing a lot of the research. Uh, it's really, that's where you can have as much quality control in terms of, for example, chain of custody of a specimen. So that's where you have your biggest variability in terms of the reliability of returning a result to an individual. Just one quick thing, I would also add with the effect of journals. I recently had a situation uh, submitting a manuscript to a journal and the journal requires that the manuscript be sent to the research participants because we had individual level data in the manuscript. And the manuscript had to be sent to the participants for them to review and approve, forcing us to disclose our research findings, right? Individual research results. And we have generally in the past used peer review as one of the metrics of validity of our findings prior to doing CLIA, return of primary findings for our patients, but the journal says we have to send the paper before it's CLIA validated. So they're kind of forcing the issue. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Paul, you had a question? So we've heard all day, and, and we just heard uh, part of it again, about the, um, the fact that all labs are not the same, all tests are not the same. There's tremendous heterogeneity. In, in what we're talking about here. Um, and um, that suggests a, and it was suggested earlier today, a highly um, individual process of deciding who returns what, uh, assuming the whole CLIA uh, regulatory issue can be worked out in, in some reasonable way. Um, with case-by-case -case determinations. Uh, on the other hand, I hear Heather's 
plea for resolving the patchwork approach that we have in the field today in some degree of uniformity. Now, admittedly, you were talking about it at the institutional level, not at the uh, individual study level, but nonetheless, um, to make case-by-case -case determinations, as we know from the IRB process in general, is time-consuming, costly, and um, invites heterogeneity in, uh, in, within and across, but especially across institutions. So I'm just wondering from your perspectives how you would urge us to proceed on that issue. Do we need a solution that covers everybody? Uh, is it a large lab, small lab line that gets drawn somewhere, however um, that's done? Or is there some other answer here? Uh, I can start, and I'll start with, I, I don't know exactly what the answer is. Um, I would urge, though, that it's, it's one thing to provide the recommendations for the regulatory fixes, the conflict between agencies, and guidance as to how to resolve these issues, whether it's study by study or size by size, to, um, to suggest that there should be, should the committee decide the return of results is a good thing and should happen full stop, to suggest that there must be a single a single system, a single way that we address that would require a, a enterprise-wide new technologies, new tracking systems uh, to put institutions and individual researchers in the position of having to return results that they don't have uh, confidence in, as opposed to not prohibiting the case where you have something where you say, this person, and the, with, under these criteria, I have reasonable, it's reasonable for me to think that this person could use this information now, later, with their children, uh, and that it's important to get that to them, or they've asked for it, is a very different, is a very different outcome. And I, I would say to, to, I would urge you to move towards the former of trying to resolve this and make it clear when it is a pro when it's appropriate to return results and what are the criteria under which we should be thinking whether they're ethical regulatory or otherwise as opposed to instituting a results returning requirement or system that then uh, puts us in a position that's as untenable as where we are now Yeah, so I was just going to add to that. Um, as we've all heard today, there is a very wide variety of different research laboratories. You have research laboratories that have very good quality of results. You have research laboratories um, that are much more in their discovery phase. I think the, the issue for, for me, as well as for the CAP, is that we want to make sure that participants and patients are staying safe. Um, as somebody who is um, unfortunately not a spring chicken anymore, uh, I have been in situations where patients have gotten results that were um, misinterpreted, that were wrong, um, and it's not a good situation for them to be in. We have talked a lot today about the potential for false positive results. We have not talked very much about false negative results. And patients, when they get return of results, may assume that when that result is negative, that it is truly negative, when in fact it may not be. Um, there were examples earlier today of where CLIA-certified laboratories were returning results that were incorrect compared to research laboratories. Um, we have to be careful about how we interpret those statements because the methodologies that may have been used may not be comparable. If you're comparing, um, and this is my analogy, if you're comparing a Tesla, uh, to a Pinto, um, then there's a very different 
um, level of interpretation that needs to occur. And that may not always be clear to people when they're looking at uh, laboratory results. My biggest concern is an informaticist, I can tell you because in my daily job, in addition to being a molecular pathologist, uh, my main job is actually being a clinical informaticist for my hospital. And over my years of experience, I can't even begin to tell you the number of examples that I've had um, where people have assumed that research results were absolutely 100% valid, where we have had requests for those results to be put into our electronic health records when there's no standard to clearly differentiate them from other results um, which have got a, a higher level of rigor. Um, and those are all things that would have to be considered as the committee is discussing this situation. I think all of us want patients to be safe. Certainly if there is something that is potentially clinically significant, patients need to be alerted by a certain mechanism, uh, whatever the committee or the government decides that should be. I do agree with other members of the panel that clarification in this area is desperately needed as there is a lot of confusion and misinformation out there. Comment. I, I think that the, the importance of keeping research participants and patients safe is paramount and should be the should be thinking of what researchers and healthcare providers um, think. I I I think that the the assumption you mentioned that a false negative uh, where people assume everything is fine, I think that also goes to silence where research participants assume that silence means everything is fine. And that can be as dangerous or more uh, dangerous. I also agree with you that, I think we've talked a lot over the day, that research results that are intended for a different purpose other than the diagnosis and treatment are different, but I think there, there has to be a way that we can resolve that, that we can mark them differently, that they, whether they get incorporated into the HR, how that happens, what process through the, um, it's worth thinking about, but I think we should not be, uh, we should not discount the ability to have research results be usable or important uh, because, simply because they are different from clinical results. I think we can distinguish them in a way that, that makes sense. I would just follow up on uh, Paul's question. It's a great question. I would just make a plea uh, and remind the panel, um, I don't think it's been said, although it's fairly obvious, the, the burdens of doing human research today are much, much greater than they were when I started. The administrative, regulatory, bureaucratic obstacles between starting and completing a research study are much greater, and I think it's at least half of our effort these days, and uh, more even for our extramural colleagues who have to fight for funding, to get a research project done. And the increasing devotion of resources to these hurdles is a frustration for us, and uh, that's nothing compared to how frustrated the patients are, uh, because they're not getting the answers that they need. And so uh, my plea is to frame these things in a context where we can actually get to, as Susan said, the good outcome that we want and not just put up more things between us and the outcome that will make us kind of feel better about the whole thing, when in fact what we really need to do is make things work better. And it makes me very, very nervous when I hear people say we want to assure quality or we want 100% accurate results. You can't have that. You just can't. Again, you have to decide. All tests have errors of both kinds, omission, commission, false positives, false negatives. And you have to say, I'm willing to tolerate this much of this kind of error because if I do it that way, enough people will get good results out of that, that that's a net good. And that's the kind of balances and trade-offs that we have to do. So that, that would be my plea in answer to your question. Steve. I actually uh, just have a simple clarifying question for Alexis on the uh, cap position that you articulated. You started out by saying something along the lines of cap opposes the return of results from labs that are not CLIA certified. But then you said, as an alternative, the, the, the sort of process of 
doing it in non CLIA certified and then returning it with a disclaimer that um, that this needs to be confirmed before it's acted on would be acceptable to CAP. And those two things, there's a sort of slight contradiction between those two things that I see. And I just want to clarify, is it, is it that you're saying that we strongly recommend that all everything be done in a CLIA lab if it's going to be returned, but we see this as an accept, acceptable alternative, or did I misinterpret the position? There's, there's a slight caveat to the position I think may have been missed, so thank you for asking that question. The CAP opposes the return of research results directly to participants. However, as an alternative, returning those results to a provider who potentially can interpret them and then decide at that point, um, you know, to alert the patient, you know, and have that conversation about what additional testing may need to happen to make sure that the patient stays safe. Just th that latter pathway presumes that there's a uh, relationship or connection or at least that the lab knows who the clinician is if they're going to go that pathway if there's no clinician in the triangle if there's no triangle then it can't happen that way that does present a problem and um, you know if this were an easy topic we would not be having these committee meetings um, so but the concern is and and what and you know I I have seen in my career you know clinical providers and I know we've talked about clinical providers not understanding you know, complex laboratory testing, not just genomic results. I've actually, you know, reviewed articles that have been submitted to journals where the researchers themselves fundamentally did not understand, uh, you know, for example, pulling cancer variants um, and saying, well, we're not going to look at germline variants. So they basically took all of the variants that were at 50% allele burden and threw them all out. When you're looking at a tumor sample, I mean, this is the fundamental types of misconceptions that you can actually see. So it's a more global problem than just not having providers who understand results. In addition to that, um, providers often think when they get a next generation sequencing assay, for example, that that includes an analysis of all the different types of variants that this patient may possibly have. They may not understand that they need to reflex to a deletion duplication test, that epigenetic changes are not included, that copy number changes are not included, um, and, and that mitochondrial genes are also not included when often they order a whole exome. It depends on the laboratory that you order it from. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that I think, this is a very complex area, um, communicating, if we're having a hard time communicating that information to providers, imagine, you know, even very highly intelligent, well-educated patients who are not physicians being able to interpret those results without the assistance of a provider who's looking out for them. Chester. Yes, I just uh, was uh, curious about your perspective on something that Wendy Chung said earlier in thinking about this, particularly the analytical validity aspect of kind of farming these uh, to the smaller lab or from the smaller labs to more centralized center kind of places that could do this kind of analysis and interpretation. What are your positions or what are your thoughts on that? My personal view is that um, many research institutions and or departments have core facilities and uh, and I'm talking about research not CLIA certified um, and they have in general better funding uh, a higher standard of resources uh, and standard protocols so that there is less variability and there is the a better opportunity for reproducibility and reliability of results. Um, but again, there is no standard across the board that is used for this. Um, I'd like to use an analogy. In 2001, the uh, Associ American Association for Human Research Protections was developed. Uh, and it was designed to really meet a need to try to standardize human research protections in institutions. That was not necessarily control of IRBs. That was what infrastructure did an institution need to have uh, in order to provide the appropriate protections for human subjects. And a lot of that meant there had to be, an, of course, there has to be an IRB, but it could be much more than that. And it was not, and I was on the board of directors for the first seven years, and so we learned a lot about developing what kind of checklists were going to be part of an accreditation process. And what delayed 
the uh, institutions from signing on. It was not the fee that was being charged, which was, was tens of thousands of dollars, but that was a drop in the bucket compared to the infrastructure, which was hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not a million dollars, to develop personnel. Uh, and uh, so these are good and bad effects. Of course, it makes everything more expensive. It makes it more bureaucratic. But the pro of that is that you get a, across the board a, a higher standard of, of things that are being done. We and others have published lists that a reasonable researcher should think about in developing their research protocol that should go to the IRB. Part of that should be, are you going to return research results? Under what circumstances? How are you going to handle secondary or incidental findings? These should all be thought of in advance and approved by the Institutional Review Board. A lot of the times, they are not even considered. And they should actually be, in my opinion, part of a checklist that's required. These are not, this is not rocket science. This is just standard thought processes. They've been published in a variety of ways. Um, each protocol should address that. Very often, it's not applicable. Fine, say that. But you at least should be going through a process where you're thinking about these things. And we could um, at least uh, minimize the amount of uncertainty uh, in a protocol. You should really know what's going to happen if you have an incidental result. There should be a process in place on how you're going to handle that, um, as well as whether results are going to be returned from the study, on, under what mechanism, when. Uh, uh, under what conditions. So I, I think that's one way that we could help begin the process of standardizing this process to, to make it more possible for more people to be knowledgeable about themselves. Um, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative for just a moment. I want to follow up with you. So g given the um, divide that we heard between the participants, ex some participants' expectation for all results and what I heard with some of the models for return of results were um, ethics committee content experts, investigators content experts. So is there a role for participants or communities or community boards in, in helping to develop the policy at an institutional level and maybe at the IRB level for how results should be returned? I think that's an excellent question, and it gets to the very crux of what we, when we, in this country at least, when we started thinking about human research protections, the Belmont Report came out, and it, it's really like, to, my, to me, it's like the Bible for how you begin to approach a research study. And, and um, central to that was the establishment of an institutional review board. Uh, so an analogy would be a community review board. Uh, and one of the components is a requirement that there be a non-institutional uh, and outsider from the community uh, that gives some um, validity to what that community, whether it's cultural, ethnic, uh, economic, uh, has a say in that. So that's, that's the minimum requirement. So I think that's a very great starting point for getting involvement um, from patients uh, and other patient care providers so that you can get a consensus. The, the best results are when you involve patient populations, get their input, get more involvement, um, but you need to be very clear on what will or will not be possible because you don't want to mislead people into participating under false circumstances either. So I think we have to respect um, the donors of the samples and the patients and the research subjects, uh, but we also have to respect the integrity of the research process to make sure that the data is integrated uh, and reliable so that it can lead to a, um, a result that will help the general public as well. It's, it's a great question, and I think <clears throat> we're, we're past the point of wondering whether or not that's true, and I think that it is abundantly clear from a number of studies and from those of us who interact with subjects uh, iteratively and longitudinally, they absolutely do expect to have input on that, have strongly held and valuable opinions on that. And in general, our experience is they want more than we are able to provide. And that this is 
unambiguously clear. And I often think, you know, that the point was made earlier that there isn't, for example, an obligation to search for secondary findings. Uh, you know, I do a simple thought experiment. Could I gather my participants in a room like this, sit them down and tell them, give them a perfectly adequate justification for why I didn't look for incidental findings in their samples? I, I just can't picture that. And so my participants, I know, expect that and are asking for that, and I don't feel that I can turn my back on them. The only other thing I just wanted to add to those statements is, and this is in part because I work at a children's hospital, a very large children's hospital. As you're having these deliberations, please make sure that you consider pediatric patients or other vulnerable populations who are involved in research. At my institution, for example, there are many analogies between what we're discussing today and patient portals. For example, uh, for returning clinical results, there are predominantly adult institutions that will return 100% of all of their laboratory test results to patients regardless of what that test result is, whether it's anatomic pathology, a genetic test result, a sexually transmitted disease result, or some other result which the patient may find very upsetting. Um, when you get into a pediatric population, and particularly when you start talking about adolescents, um, where there's a, a bit of a gray area between who actually should be getting those results um, uh, and who should be seeing those results, because there are some adolescents who are at risk if you allow them to see certain, their parents to see certain results that they may have. Um, those are questions for consideration as you move forward and discuss this. Jeff. Yes, may kind of under the category of uh, beating the horse, but it's not quite dead yet. So uh, I think we had a fair amount of consensus in the last panel about the following, with sort of terminology maybe uh, quibbles aside. So if you're planning a study and you're going to be returning results, get CLIA, use a CLIA certified lab. The issue may arise then with unanticipated findings. You're using a uh, non-CLIA certified lab. You've uh, identify a finding that has significant clinical implications. The question is, should there be a route forward for those investigators to disclose enough to the participant that they can pursue subsequent testing in a CLIA certified laboratory? Would you be comfortable, each of you, with a system of that sort, and do you see any risks of that sort of system to, uh, for either abuse or uh, decline in the quality of uh, uh, testing? So, so I would strongly um, encourage such a system where there was a path from the research lab to confirmation in a CLIA certified laboratory. There are some caveats. Um, some CLIA certified laboratories simply do not have the infrastructure for doing certain tests, uh, then you always have the uh, special exemptions for rare diseases where, um, where actually it is legal to, f in certain situations. So I think, I think to say, I think it's a little too broad to say if you're planning to return research results, you should automatically have those done in a CLIA certified lab, because it depends on the test and whether the there is such a validated test at this point, and a lot of research leads toward that. So I, I don't think it's one size fits all, but I think loosening up the terminology and the, wor and the regulations or guidances that would uh, make it easier for, uh, I mean, it, to me it just makes no sense that a research laboratory um, has results and it cannot provide those to other people uh, there has to be a mechanism for getting those validated and certified so that important information gets out to the appropriate people. It just has to be done in a safe uh, manner, and right now our best mechanism is the CLIA certified laboratory. They have processes in place and an infrastructure in place to guarantee quality control, to guarantee chain of custody, um, but there are going to be we heard many exceptions today, and those are real, and it doesn't mean that the information should be thrown out. It should, it's in my opinion, it should be possible for CLIA to change its regulation and say, yes, um, this is, let the patient know that they should 
have some, a test done in a CLIA certified laboratory, that that in and of itself is not giving patient results. Uh, that would really loosen up the structure, and that would be an example of just trying to harmonize these regulations between Office of Civil Rights and FDA and CMS. I mean, to me, it's just mind boggling that they can't come to an agreement and even follow actually what, in my opinion, a very reasonable um, uh, uh, consensus that SACARP came up with now two years ago, um, but it hasn't been endorsed by the agency. So uh, this is this is the bureaucracy that we're all struggling with. The only thing I wanted to add to that is that when you run into a situation like that where you cannot find a CLIA validated test or CLIA laboratory with a, a test that would be able to reproduce those results, that's an even better argument to get a, pr a clinical provider involved um, because, as you know, there are multiple ways to approach certain diagnoses. You don't necessarily, in some instances, have to repeat the exact same test result that came out of the research laboratory. There can be other CLIA validated um, ways of approaching that diagnosis. There are exceptions to that, obviously, but if you're in that kind of difficult conundrum and you're returning that to a patient who doesn't have the clinical training to understand, that patient may do nothing about it simply because they don't understand it, and that would be a tragedy if it were actually clinically significant. And this can also be predicted because when you're do developing your research plan, you know whether or not there is a CLIA certified uh, laboratory that can provide that answer, and you're probably providing, doing a research study to provide an alternative or something that's, that's missing. So that should be anticipated in your research plan. That should be reviewed by the institutional review board. So you have a plan in place for how you will deal with the fact that you want to have results followed up appropriately for clinical care. This can all be it's thought of in advance and should be part of the research plan. Well, I have a little bit of a different approach to your question, Jeff, and I feel that research is fairly unpredictable. And as well, I think, you know, intent, you seem to have intent built into your system, what the researcher intends to do in the future, and I think that can be very hard to predict. And I would say, let's not think about intent, let's focus on the outcome and the situation that you end up in and do the right thing in that situation irrespective of what the intent may have been at the outset. Greg. So I, I'm just trying to think of this in a continuum. So Fran said this morning that she wants all 100 data points. Now she didn't say she wanted 100 results. So maybe there's data that's on, that you can't make actionable today. It's, it's a, a set of data that uh, I want as, as a priority for open access to data, as part of my own personal biological information. Then there's stuff that you, you can run through a CLIA lab. It's actionable, doctors will know what to do with it, nurses will know what to do with it. Then there's stuff in the middle where perhaps you can get to a, a medically actionable um, decision through a, a test that is already sort of a standard of care, even though the developmental test is just giving you some clues towards it. So, but that means you're gonna have to triage, you're gonna have to sort of categorize a set of data that you, you can give to patients where there's no interpretation because there's none available at the moment. Then there's some that's sort of in this gray zone where you're probably gonna have to add clinical judgment and some sort of validated laboratory test. And then there's stuff that's sort of just matter of fact uh, that needs to be transferred to clinician and they can easily interpret. But you know, I, I think it's three separate categories of data. Chester, did you have another question? Sure. While the, uh, the committee is sort of winding down in energy for, for the day and thinking about this, uh, I want to echo and hopefully amplify Les's recommendation that, that this really needs to be, you need to consider regulatory burden in this process. And the outcome should be to make this better, to add clarity and not complexity. Uh, I know several of you were involved in the incredibly influential report from the academies on optimizing the nation's investment in research uh, that actually 
turned into legislation through the 21st Century Cures Act to decrease regulatory burden in very specific areas. I, I would hope that the committee would would uh, consider that as part of its uh, as part of its charge to think about how to make the system work better overall and not just have more more clarity at the uh, at the expense of a huge amount of increased burden. So appreciate Les bringing that up. So I just uh, had a couple of comments about that. Um, clinical laboratories also are under a huge, huge regulatory burden. Uh, when I describe to people outside the laboratory what all we have to go through in order to report results on patients, um, people are often flabbergasted. Um, and uh, so this is, not a, this is not an issue that is limited uh, to research laboratories. Our own clinical revenues are drying up sort of left and right, so we, we also have those issues uh, that the research labs are, are experiencing. The other thing I would add, um, because there have been a couple of comments today about the analytical validity of next generation sequencing tests. Um, the Association of Molecular Pathology uh, has submitted, uh, but not yet had accepted, a publication on a validation guideline for next generation sequencing uh, pipelines, bioinformatics pipelines. Um, while I can't, uh, I'm on that committee, so in full disclosure, the working group that developed that, um, I can't disclose the results because there's an embargo, but what I will tell you is that um, the experience of myself as well as several other colleagues on that working group indicated that there were some very well-known vendor-developed pipelines that had um, some pretty significant errors in their code which caused certain results to go completely missing such that the pathologist and or geneticist did not even have them available to them to review. Um, so I would caution um, that bioinformatics pipelines are exceedingly complex animals. Um, they require a lot of um, validation. And um, in addition to that, all it takes is really one line of code to hide results from people. Um, so the committee should be considering that as part of their discussion on this subject. Just follow up on that. From a clinical perspective, there's a huge difference between uh, false positives and false negatives here. And the, the false positive issue just isn't that big of a problem. You can see a variant when it's there. It's fairly straightforward and simple to be confident that you're correct. And what Alexis said is really important. What You don't know what you don't know. And so the unknown unknowns false negative, false reassurance is something we all have to be very mindful of and it's why uh, in our practice is we rarely give out negative reports for that exact reason is we don't know what the analytic validity is of a negative finding. It's a hard problem. So I have another question uh, for Heather and Mark I think to start. So Heather, you mentioned wanting multi-agency guidance that would be helpful to institutions. And Mark, you talked about uh, the responsibility uh, resting in the IRB, but then you also talked about AHARP. So what is the structure? What, what is the model where that guidance, who shares, how is that responsibility distributed between the institution and where in the institution and the IRB in implementing new guidance? So um, the AHARP um, paradigm was that it was the institution as the sponsor of the research that was ultimately responsible for all the research carried out under their aegis. And the IRB is often a, sometimes the only, uh, at, at the very least, the major player in that. But in order for the IRB to function or multiple IRBs to function, you have to have an infrastructure in place. You have to have staff in place. Um, you shouldn't be delaying the review of applications uh, because there are too few um, IRBs in place um, so that you're not delaying the process. And so that's where, that, so it's ultimately the institution has to have a, a, a structure in place for handling this. Uh, and um, so that's where the onus would be and it would be the um, institutional official ultimately responsible who would be uh, 
guiding a process, and I think at the beginning there would be task forces so that they could translate, let's say, the multi-agency consensus guidance into actionable procedures in place that would then fall into place. So that's going to take time and quite a bit of money. Um, and those resources need to be found because they don't exist right now. Um, but that would really assist the entire process. Um, and then you would probably strategize um, this process first for human subject research. Uh, but hopefully in, in the future, and then I know it's not the, the purpose of this committee, but um, <laughs> To, to enhance the reproducibility and rigor of all research done within an institution's walls, those lessons learned from the more, um, from the human subjects could be um, moved into the other mo model systems that researchers use. And those, those are often used as cases in point or the initial pilot studies before you even move to human subject um, work. So they're really, they're not separate processes, but um, we just need to keep track of these different models that we're using. Nadia, your, your question brings up uh, a really important point for the committee, and that is that all the regulatory schemes that we've been talking about are all institutionally focused. The common rule on the protection of human subjects tells the institution what they need to tell the investigator to do. The, uh, the NIH, the Public Health Service Rules on Conflicts of Interest say what the institution has to do to get information from investigators and researchers. Uh, that, that is not necessarily the way it had to go. There have been lots of uh, recommendations and suggestions, including from the AAMC, that the common rule when it was revised should include specific directions and obligations, enforceable obligations on investigators. That is not how any of these regulatory schemes work, uh, primarily because it is the institution that receives federal grant money. And so uh, that it's when making recommendations to the extent that they will be enforceable or can be taken up by an agency, my, my sense is that they need to continue to be focused at the institution level and not at the researcher level. The institution then has the obligation to interpret the regulations, as you said, turn that into their own policies, and then train the IRB research staff, technicians, and investigators. It is not a short or a cost-free um, process, but it's an important one. Do we have anyone left online who might have a question? Committee members, other questions? And um, any questions from our public guests? Do I have the honor of ending early? <laughs> Can I just add oh, sure. So just one more thing for the committee to consider. As I've been, as I've been sitting here today, um, I was making sort of a list of things in my head um, because as a clinical informaticist, I bring sort of a bit of a different perspective to some of this. A couple of people today have mentioned the issue of sample switches. I would just like to remind the committee that a sample switch does not affect one patient. It affects at least two patients. So that means you've got a patient with a result that is false, and now you have another patient out there who may have another, may not know about a result that they need to hear about. Um, the sample patient identification in research laboratories that have traditionally focused on reporting results at a population perspective um, may not have been as stringent as they often are in clinical laboratories. Um, when I went looking through the literature before I came onto this panel, there are lots of studies out there that actually look at how robust is our specimen identification stringency in clinical laboratories. I could not find one U.S. or European study that had actually focused on that issue. It is possible that I missed it, but I don't think so. 
So I would encourage uh, this committee to potentially gather some data. That one pre-analytical variable, if you're going to be considering the possibility of returning results to an individual participant, that sample identification is incredibly important. Molecular barcodes will only help you demultiplex a pooled result. If that sample identification was wrong at the outset, the molecular barcode is not going to help you. To follow up on that, that the uh, perverse um, consequence of the idea that going back to a research participant and getting a second sample, another sample type, is far and away the most robust solution to that problem. And so uh, the last thing in the world we would want to do is discourage someone from doing that. I want to thank the panel members and the committee for your questions. All right, excellent panel, thank you so much. All right, been a long day. Uh, lots of um, important information and discussion for the committee. And uh, we are going to be, committee has breakfast at 7.30. Uh, the main meeting will start again uh, in this room at eight o'clock uh, tomorrow morning. So uh, thanks again, and we look forward to seeing uh, hopefully everybody tomorrow morning. Committee